So the next aspect to think about is charitable status. So we talked about incorporated trust boards and the, um, the relevant legislation there, which has a very similar name, the Charitable Trusts Act. So we do need to be a little bit careful that we don't get those two confused, but the Charitable Trusts Act is what sets up an incorporated trust board. Um, the Charities Act sets out and, and how you apply for and obtain that um, and the benefits. So effectively, all of those not-for-profit entity types um, basically have a purpose and in most cases operate um, not for a profitable purpose, but um, for a, you know, a, a charitable endeavour. So the problem is not all not-for-profits are charities. Obviously, these structure types are used for all sorts of groups, um, sports clubs, um, racing clubs. Um, there's all sorts of different entity types or group types that use those structures. So a, a not-for-profit, um, not all of them are charities. But on the flip side, all charities that are registered under the Charities Act are not-for-profits. So being a not-for-profit entity is a key requirement of becoming a charity. So what happens is if you are starting from scratch, you would select your entity type. Um, and if it were an incorporated entity type, so a company, an incorporated society, or an incorporated trust board, um, then you would also have a second option, um, which is to apply to the Charities Commission to get charitable status. So basically, that's a, another second registration, if you like, um, and that brings about a number of benefits, um, which we'll walk through at the end. So one of the key requirements for becoming charitable is that you have a charitable purpose. Um, and this is something that's, that's really, really, really old and ingrained in um, the, I guess, English legal system. So basically the charitable purposes or charitable objects um, we've set out in some legislation from, would you believe it, 1601, um, the Statute of Elizabeth. Um, so this dates back a, a really long way, but has been maintained um, through both the English legal system and has flowed into the New Zealand legal system as well. So there's basically four charitable purposes or, or objects, and you need to fall into one of those categories in order to get charitable status. So the, the first three there are relieving poverty, advancing education, and advancing religion. Um, so those three, not overly relevant um, to catchment groups, potentially advancing education might be relevant. But there's a fourth category, which we think you're likely to fit into, um, irrigation schemes possibly as well. So other purposes beneficial to the community. So that's a really broad sounding um, purpose, but it is subject to a legal test. And as you'd expect, we've got 400 years of um, case law outlining what a um, what the other purpose beneficial to the community is. And pleasingly, the environment um, forms a bigger and bigger part of um, other purposes beneficial to the community. So. There's some key elements that have been developed over the years um, for what that actually means. So the legal test covers off um, the, the, those five key requirements. So the first is being similar to another charitable purpose. So almost fitting into poverty, education, or religion, um, but not quite. The second is that the benefit that the purpose relates to is for a public for the public or a section of the public. The third is that there's a benefit capable of being defined or identified. Fourth, it can't be illegal or harmful. And fifth, there's no pecuniary gain for um, the members or for the um, committee running the organisation. 
So those are the five key aspects. Um, you might remember a while ago, um, this dates back to August 2020, there was a Greenpeace case. Um, so they had their charitable status removed. And obviously that was very worrying to them. So they appealed that decision by the Charities Commission and, and went up through the courts. And pleasingly, they won that case. Um, there was a lot of argument back and forward, but the, the general themes that came out of it was that environmental protection is a charitable purpose. And Greenpeace's other main purpose being advocacy, um, the court found that advocacy advances the public benefit. So they found that all five requirements for other purposes beneficial to the community were satisfied and Greenpeace's charitable status was reinstated. Um, so that gives us some confidence for rural catchment groups um, and, and those sorts of irrigation schemes that if you're really clear around what your uh, purpose is um, and that fits into something similar to Greenpeace, um, then you'd be successful in obtaining uh, charitable status. So there's a few hoops to jump through. You've got to convince the commissioner that um, all of those requirements are met, um, but with a, a really clear um, trust deed or rules for the incorporated society or constitution um, for a company um, with really clear documentation, honing in on what that purpose is, um, then charitable status should be able to be obtained. So it's obviously a, a register. Um, so you apply for registration. Um, the commissioner checks the documents. Um, there's a bit of scrutiny that goes in there. And then once you've satisfied the commissioner of all the requirements, then you go on the public register. So it's a very public process. Um, there's a publicly searchable register um, that you can look through. And as part of that, um, people can also search for your rules um, or constitution or trustee, those sorts of things. All those documents become public at that point. Um, the main benefit of obtaining charitable status is an exemption for income tax. So any profit um, that is earned during a financial year Ordinarily, um, a not-for-profit would pay tax on that. There are other exemptions. Uh, I think there's a $1,000 profit exemption for all not-for-profits and other exemptions as well, like sports clubs. Um, but obtaining charitable status gives you a blanket income tax exemption. So really helpful there, particularly if um, money that's been earned or grants or things are deferred to following years. Obviously, tax advice is key there. We're not tax advisors, so we'd suggest you work in with your accountant around what that looks like. But the tax um, exemption is one of the key benefits of obtaining charitable status. One of the other benefits is donee status. So that means anyone donating money to the charity um, can obtain tax relief as well. Funding benefits. Um, often having charitable status gives um, people who give grants or funders or donors um, a bit more confidence about the entity, um, that it's kind of legitimate, it's being thoroughly scrutinized and it does in fact have a charitable purpose. So people can be more inclined to give money um, to those entities that do have charitable status, not in all cases, but, but generally as a theme. And that um, drives the reputation. Um, of, of the entity. Again, it's a higher level of scrutiny um, that's applied to the organisation. And as a result, um, we often see that, that charities are held in fairly high regard. Trust and confidence, same kind of concept. Um, it, it builds with um, incorporation. So from unincorporated to incorporation, we see a, a level of trust being established there. And then from incorporation to getting charitable status um, same sort of thing, it, it builds through each step. Um, the DIA um, sort of have the overall um, oversight as a regulator of, of charities um, and they can be heavy hitting in cases. Um, so they also add a level of scrutiny, um, but also the trade-off is accountability to the DIA. 
Um, so if they have concerns, they'll ask questions and um, the organisation would need to respond to those. So the DIA is the, the regulator overall. So from a overall perspective, um, charitable status is, yeah, it is a really good benefit to obtain um, particularly that income tax exemption. 